I'm hoping this time we are live. Can you hear me, Nurse Liz? Okay, excellent. Okay, good. Welcome. Okay, first of all, tell me in the chat where you're from. Like, tell us a little bit about yourself, like how close you are to graduating and what you want most out of this session. All right? So just give me a couple of notes in the chat. We'll take a look at that. Oh, I see some friends coming in. Thank you. We're so glad that you're here. I promise I am going to give you practical tips that you could take out. Okay. So go ahead and type in the, if you're in the Discord chat, that's fantastic. You can type just Massachusetts. I love it. You're cold. Yeah. Now that chat is just for us. This is just for students and you're hanging out with us. Oh, Tampa, Florida. I bet you're warmer than I am. Yes. I can see your questions, and if I miss one, Nurse Liz is going to help me catch it. So if you hear her voice come on, she's just trying to tell me. All right, how many people have had a long week here? Tell me in the chat, how many people have had a long week? I have for sure. That good? We got some things? Well, let's get going and talk about how we can make your week better. Maybe you had a test this week. Maybe you, um, maybe you're studying for one. Maybe you have one coming up. But let's talk about it. Oh, Diane, welcome! I love it when a faculty wants to hang out with students. You're always the best kind of faculty. Very cool. All right, so we're going to talk about note-taking strategies that are going to help you raise your exam grades and lower your frustration because that's what all of us want. I'm Prof. Laws. And Nurse Liz is here with us. She's running everything in the background for us. So it all runs smoothly. So we have a little hiccup with our starting point, but we'll get that for you next time. Okay. I had students today in the classroom with pathophysiology. And I asked them, hey, guys, what makes it difficult for you to study? And here's some of the things they came up with distractions. I feel overwhelmed. I can't tell what's most important. I'm struggling with time management. Nursing school questions are tricky. I don't disagree with any of these, but would you do me a favor? Um, we'll make number one distractions, number two overwhelmed, number three time management, and number four is nursing school questions are tricky. Which one do you think is the most challenging for you? Put those, you can either put them in order, rank them in order for yourself, or just write the one that is the biggest challenge for you right now. That will help me know where I need to steer our conversation to give you the best information. <laughs> Shannon just wrote, nursing school questions are the devil. I agree. I agree. Yeah, that's a great, oh, and the, the picture goes right with that. I like it. Select all that apply. Okay, people don't like those. Either. So right up with the nursing school questions are tricky. Okay, so a lot of you are saying nursing school questions. Good news is that's my specialty. That's what I love to do. That's why I went into educational psychology. Yeah, nursing school questions can be tricky, but I'm going to help you understand some strategies today on how the way you take notes, how those notes can help you prepare for an exam and do better on exam. So let's get rolling with the real meat and the practical stuff of our session. Now, these are seven strategies I want you to think about. And also, um, if you have, we, we'll send you a handout. If you'd like it, we can post it here in Discord. But I'd like you to have something to write on, just a piece of scratch paper to when we start practicing and answering questions that you're able to do that. So if you've got some scratch paper, if you want to do it on your phone, however you want to do it. But I'd like you to have some scratch paper. I'm going to teach you a strategy for answering questions with paper. Okay, so... First, we're going to go over these seven top strategies. Number one, be selective. So if you're in class trying to write everything down that your faculty is saying, that's what a court reporter does. That is not what you want to do oh. in class because you're just going to get frustrated, right? You're just, you can't do it. You can't write as fast as someone can speak. And then when you miss a point, you get really worked up. I know I do and I've missed something. So I want to help you learn how to be selective, how to only select the most important oh. information. Now, I know you're going to tell me if I knew that I wouldn't need to be here today. It's a skill. It's like a muscle. You will develop it. OK, how your classes should work is that you should have learning objectives oh. for that class. If you don't know if you do or not, 
then you just need to talk to your faculty, right? Ask them that should be kind of on their lesson or, you know, you could ask your faculty, what's the most important thing you want us all to learn today? Okay, that that's an easy answer, way to do it. Shannon, that is a really good point about how to, to apply the information. I'm gonna take care of that for you. So I want you to think about your current note-taking strategy. Anybody feel safe enough to tell us if you're one who tries to write down every word the faculty oh. says? I, she does. I'm going to have to do something. She's been quiet up until now, of course. Yeah, that's a great oh. comment, Shannon. All right. So be aware of what your current note-taking strategy is, and let's evaluate it as we walk through these seven things. And hopefully... Harley the Wonder Schnauzer will not keep uh, interrupting us. Sorry about that, friends. So <coughs> writing less is what I'm probably going to ask most of you to do. Now, second thing, I want you to think about abbreviations and symbols. Shorthand can save you a lot of time and make your notes <coughs> more readable. So try that with abbreviations and symbols. And I'll talk about, I'll show you some of the ones that I use <coughs> and things that you can help you go back and read your notes later. Now, the third one is you need to organize your information. So I want you to look at headings, bullet points, use some other formatting techniques to make your notes easy to read and to follow. So think on that thought for just a minute. I'm going to take care of the schnauzer and I'll be right back. Hey friends, isn't her dog cute? <laughs> I'm just popping on just to let you know we haven't abandoned you. We just had to do a little bit of um, Prof Laws's dog is very excitable, very adorable. Um, but there we go. She'll be back in just a second. Um, I'm going to get off because otherwise, oh, here we go. She's already back. Perfect. Problem. Welcome back to rewarding bad pet behavior. <laughs> so here we go. Thanks Nurse Liz for coming up. She'll be busy for a little while now. So third one, how are you organizing your information on your notes? Are you one of those people that can do like a beautiful bullet journal? You use lots of colors. Yeah, those are gorgeous, but I can never get that right. You need to set up some consistent systems that will help you organize it. So think about when you're going back and looking at your notes, if you didn't make a heading, create one. And I'm going to show you a strategy with Cornell note taking and a worst case scenario strategy that will help you do that. If you can do it while you're taking notes, that's the best. If you have to go back and do it afterwards, that's okay. Because I think if I ask some of you, you take a lot of notes, but sometimes you don't really spend a lot of time with the notes after class. Or when you go back and read your notes, you're not sure what they were telling you or what you wrote down or why did you write that. That's really okay. That's going to happen to you when you go back and look at your notes and you're not really sure what you're doing. I'm going to show you how to fix that and how to follow up on that and that it's not always a bad thing. So context really matters. When you're writing the notes, it's better if you write them in your own words instead of your professor's words, okay? So as much as you can, the mental gymnastics that you do to write your notes in your words is going to make it easier for you to remember and know what you're talking about when you did that. So you want to include connections and examples, and you want to make sure that you're just adding things in as you go, and then you'll add more after you're done with the notes. Now, I know this is not a popular subject because everybody is trying to keep up with everything. As a nursing student today, you're just saying, like, I just feel like I'm treading water. I never feel like I'm ahead on anything. I just feel like I'm fighting to keep ahead. And I'm sure many of you feel that way, too. So using context, what does this mean? Anytime you just have a fact, it's really not that helpful to you. If you've memorized, like, all the hormones that the adrenal gland puts out, that really doesn't help you. It's just the first step. Okay, so you have to look at what's really an effective way for me to study. So let's talk about reviewing. Now, this is a hard one to do because, man, when I make it through a class, the last thing I want to do is revisit it. You may feel the same or maybe you're really good at this, but this one takes discipline. So regularly reviewing your notes like the same day, and I'll show you how to do that where it won't take you a phenomenally long amount of time. 
right? But reviewing your notes on a daily basis is really going to help you, even if it's just short periods of time. Now, hey, if you want to challenge me on that or you have questions on that, I can definitely tell you the research at how getting things from your short-term memory to your long-term memory, where you can recall it and make sense out of it, takes a lot of work to do that. And it's not really necessarily as difficult as you think. It takes consistency. It would be better for you to study 10 minutes a day over six days than to just put an hour in the night before the exam. So this is what you're looking for. How can I be consistent? That means consistency beats intensity every time. Now, participating in class. This might feel awkward to you, but if you can look for a way that you can ask questions, that's the best, okay? Ask your faculty, see how they feel in this format, if it's okay, if you ask questions, or ask the faculty, hey, what's your preference if I have a question about the content? Would you like me to wait till the end? Can I ask during the lecture? Um, sometimes the way my brain works, if I can't get a question answered and this first part doesn't make sense to me, then I have a really hard time following the rest of it, right? And I get super frustrated. So um, ask your faculty, uh, what's the best way for them to ask questions, uh, for you to ask questions and when they would prefer that. And then try and engage in the notes. You have to do something in class. Just sitting back and listening, if you have the slightest bit of ADHD, your brain is gonna go 5,000 different directions. You need to do something to engage yourself. Now, if you're a highly unusual, um, like you are a complete auditory learner with um, you have this amazing memory, I would love to just watch you study. And I have had students like that. I've had student, I had a student sit in my farm class and he sat there like asleep in his seat with his hat over his head and sunglasses on. And I thought, I cannot wait for this guy to take his first farm test. And then when he did, he aced it. And I learned right there as a faculty hey, if you're gaining the information, it doesn't matter to me how you get it. <laughs> so I just told him, you enjoy your nap, sir, because obviously something is getting through in a format that's getting through. But most of us can't do that. That guy went on to be a CRNA and he's just had an incredible career, but he is the exception. He's not much like, our, um, like the rest of us mere mortals. Okay, so first, I want you to be write less in your notes, be selective, only put what's in there. Think of it as really important real estate. Use abbreviations and symbols. Think about how you're gonna organize this information so it makes sense. Remember when you're reading a textbook, it has bolded headings, it has color pictures. You try and do the similar thing at yours because just having a fact down on a page, you have to know why did the faculty think this was important? Make sure you understand the context, review regularly, participate in class. And here's our last one. I want you to have an intentional note taking method. Now, I would imagine a lot of you, I surveyed my students this morning and asked how many were taught these skills in high school. And the answer was nobody and in my class had had that before. So if no one's ever taught you how to take notes, um, would you just l let us know, like in the Discord or in um, on StreamYard, just let us know, I didn't learn this in school. How many people weren't taught how to take notes in high school? Okay, I'm going to get a sip of soda while you guys wait. I see some people writing. Thank you, Esther. So tell us if you were or were not taught this in high school. Okay. Okay, there's one. <laughs> Thank you. Well, most of you haven't. The reason I asked that is because I want you to be thinking about, there's a reason note-taking is difficult for you because it is a skill. And if you haven't had any training in it or any teaching in it, that's why it's difficult. That's why you're really struggling to know what's important. How should I do it? How can I write notes that help me study? What can I do? That's why I'm really glad that you're here today because I'm gonna show you two methods and you can either use them together or you can use them separately. It's completely up to you. But here's what I'd like you to use that blank sheet of paper. Okay, so grab that, that paper, scratch paper, doesn't have to be fancy. 
does not have to be fancy, but I want you to grab a piece of paper because I want you to practice taking notes. Okay. All right. So the first method is called the Cornell note taking template. Now I didn't create this, but I'm going to tell you, I have found it very efficient way for me to process information and to do less of that, just reading and rereading and reading and rereading or highlighting, highlighting. Yes. I see your question there that it is hard. I love it. I said, Dana, I, if I learned it, I was taking a nap. That's a great answer. This is going to help you differentiate what is the most important part. Are you going to be 100%? Never, never. But you're going to see things that are better and you're going to grab more key points out of it. So here's the strategy. I want you to take that paper that you have and I want you to just draw these lines on it like I have here. This is a template made up by another faculty. I cannot take credit for this, but it's really effective on how it works. So go ahead, take the time and just write that out quickly. Let me show you what goes in this one little section here, right? Where it says main notes and key thoughts. When you walk into a class, this is a blank sheet of paper, or you can write your template ahead of time, but you go in and you don't have any of your notes on here yet. While you are reading or while you're in class, so I'll give you tips for when you, if you're reading a textbook or reading an online resource, what you need to do. You want to make sure that these are where you write the main thoughts, the main notes on what you're taking a look at. Use the abbreviations here, but here's the key. Leave space to add notes in later. Notes are a living, breathing document. They should be changing and evolving all the time. So what you take in class should change significantly before you get to the exam, and I'll show you how. But here's where you start taking notes. You're going to use a lot more paper in the classroom, and that's totally okay. But know that I want you to start thinking about trying this in your next class, or you can try it with one of our videos. I promise you, if you try this with one of our videos, like you watch one of the videos in MedSurge, or you watch one in Pharmacology, and you try this note-taking template, and you send it to me, I'll give you feedback. Tell me which video you watched, and I'll give you feedback on how, like, great, you did really good on this, or here's something else you might catch. So if you really take me up on the challenge, you do it, and I'll give you individualized feedback on that. So if you're here today and you heard that challenge, that's for you. That's a special bonus for you taking the time to come today because we love having you here. Now, the summary, that's something where you're going to write the main ideas and major points. So you're going to write this in a review session, and you want to do your review session before you go to sleep that night. Why? Remember, you have three types of memory. Short-term memory, working memory, long-term memory. If you have that feeling when you take a test, you're like, oh, I know we studied that. I just can't remember. That means you didn't get it into your long-term memory. Okay, that's the problem. If you want to be able to apply information and answer those tricky nursing questions, you have to get the content into your working memory. So if you sit down same day, as much as you are not going to want to, if you will sit down and look at your main notes and key thoughts, and I want you to just write brief summaries. Don't rewrite your notes. That's not what we're asking. I'm looking for you to find like key thoughts, key points. As we're all nursing majors here, whether you're a faculty or a student, um, know that as faculty, this is what we think through before we do a lecture for you. We make sure we know like what are the most important points I need them to walk out with. That should also come through in our lectures. If you can't tell, that's a fair question, right? That's okay to have, make an appointment with your faculty, ask them, hey, I'm struggling with this, to recognize what the main point is. What is your system? Um, is there a way that you note those on the PowerPoint? But try first. Make sure you look at the faculty's PowerPoints, look at the things before you go in to talk to them because you're going to get a much more detailed response from a faculty if you show them that, look, I'm, I'm trying to prioritize here, but I'm not clear on how this class really lays out. That will be, most of them will say, oh, okay, here, let me show you what I'm thinking about. And when you see a PowerPoint, this is how I would identify the main concepts. So you really can have a professional conversation with your faculty about that. Most of them would completely welcome that with you. So you've got these three sections. First one, big one, but still not that big as a whole page. Main notes, key thoughts. Bottom page, before you go to sleep, you have to write a summary. 
So when you're writing that summary, you're taking all these big thoughts and you're distilling it down. If you think you can remember everything that's said in a class for the exam, you got to let that dream die. As we say, Elsa that, let it go. You can't do it. You're not going to get to the exam and know everything 100%, but you can get to the exam with better critical thinking skills than when you started studying for this exam. There's the key. I'll show you how to kind of work through that. And we have lots of practice questions for you. Now, that's another thing in our Discord community. If you're here with us in Discord, totally free. We have live tutoring on there right now going like two or three times a week for pathophysiology. So if you want to brush up on that, we have a nursing student who is leading that who's so sharp. And if there's ever anything that you guys want to refer to me, she knows she has my personal number. She can get a hold of me right away. So we'll do that. So come and hang out with us, try and answer those questions and just meet some other people that are going through the same tough things that you are. So we got the main notes. We got the summary. Now over here, Q questions. After you've written down your main notes, I want you to write Q question, key points to test yourself on. So you either look at the key points and say, oh, I want to rewrite it like this. I'll give you some examples. You can rephrase your notes as a question or you can write questions on the same day as class. I would recommend. But if you don't write them the next day within 24 hours. But the summary, same day, the summary, same day, the summary, same day. While the information, you still have enough of it in your mind to make a better summary than if you're trying to read back and think back on what you tried to say. Okay, so that is the Cornell method kind of in a nutshell. Let me give you an example of how you could use that. So your notes would look like this, right? At the top, I put the title. That's also helpful to know what the title of the lecture is, the date. And then I have just cues, notes, and summary. I'm going to show you how to leverage this for answering test questions, I promise. But what this system does for you is that you are studying as you're updating your notes. So this is so much more effective. The educational psychologist in me gets, woo -hoo 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 -hoo, gets all excited because this does a lot of things that can really help you retain this information and start connecting the dots. Another reason why you want to touch information on a very consistent basis is that you have diffuse brain time in between. So you've got time. Your brain is constantly working on the things that you put in it. Like haven't you ever, like you couldn't remember who a certain movie star was, but then like you're in the shower and randomly you're like, ah, that's their name. Or you wake up and you solve the problem. Your brain is working in the background all the time. I know in school, sometimes it feels like I'm not sure I have a brain. That's how you feel sometimes because you are so tired. That's not true. So doing this information, following steps for studying. And if you have to change the word studying to something else, do it. But this is the way using your notes to leverage your knowledge is the most efficient way to study. Because we know through a lot of very boring research studies that asking yourself questions is the number one way to increase your retention. That's what the cues column does for you. So when you use those, you're going to cover up the notes, ask yourself the questions and answer it. If you have family members who've forgotten what you look like or even small children, if you write your questions well enough in the cues, they can ask you and see if you can answer it right. It's a good way to reintroduce yourself and kind of include them in your journey as you're going along. So let me show an example. Let's say that you and I were doing an endocrine class, which I would likely enjoy far more than you, but I really, really enjoy it. So I've got the title up there, Addison's Disease, February 8th. Now, as I'm going through class, these would be the things I would write down. If you look at this, I just say like two adrenal glands in the system. Now, see an abbreviation that I use there? Q, because we all know that in nursing, that means every. So or each, each gland uh, has a cortex and a medulla. I've got, it secretes several hormones, but did I stop right there and write out every hormone that the faculty told us? No, there'd be no way, because then I would be lost and I would miss one. I'd be asking my neighbor and it, it wouldn't work. I just know it secretes several hormones. Can I go back and look that up later? Uh, yeah, really can. So I can put that down and I can write myself a little note. I might put a star by it or whatever your symbol is for make sure you follow up here. That's what you would put in your notes. Now, I know that I, the cortex, it has two parts to the adrenal gland, the cortex and the medulla. 
I left space in between those because I'm going to go back and write in the steroids that come from the cortex and the steroids that come from the medulla because the cortex has the corticosteroids, right? The corticosteroids and come from the cort. No, so that's just an easy way to learn it. I don't have an enunciation problem right now. That's just how I always remembered that because corticosteroids come from the cortex of the adrenal gland. The medulla sends us some other things, right? We've got other substances there, but is it more important in the lecture that you memorize which ones are in the cortex and which ones are in the medulla? No. You can go back and put that on your notes later. Don't try and keep up with stuff like that. If it's something you can easily go back and snag from your notes, don't try and write it out verbatim. Now look at that fourth point. Okay, so I know that the adrenal gland, oh, what does it regulate? Metabolism, blood pressure, stress response. So metabolism, BP, because I don't need to write out blood pressure, and stress response. Those are some pretty key points. And again, I know I feel your stress on, you're gonna have to practice this skill before you get good at it. But that's just one page of my notes. There's gonna be more in the lecture and there would be more notes. I just wanted you to see kind of what you're looking for. Now, as we go through um, the cues that you can write, try and write them within 24 hours. Look, I'm asking myself in the cues, what hormones does the adrenal medulla secrete? What about the adrenal cortex? So I would challenge myself if I could go back and answer that. Which bodily processes does the adrenal gland regulate? Now, the whole key to understanding endocrine disorders is you either have the normal amount, you have too much, or you have not enough. So if you know what that hormone does, when you don't have enough of it, you'll get the opposite. So if that hormone, like antidiuretic hormone, well, you have tells you to hang on to water, it's against diuresing. If I have too much of that, I'm going to blow up like a tick. If I have something like aldosterone, aldosterone tells my body to hang on to sodium. And whenever I hang on to sodium, water follows, right? So I know if I have a lot of aldosterone, I'm going to have extra sodium and water. But if I don't have enough aldosterone, I'm going to have less volume on board. So if you and I had the time to do a lecture, those are kind of some of the things I would want you to know. Now, let's say you've gone to class, right? You've done your notes and you have more pages than this. But what I have written at the bottom is kind of like the worst case scenario. Like what's the worst thing that can happen if someone who has Addison's disease, that means they don't have enough hormones. And you would have known that if you, you may have already known that if you didn't know that today, we get did to do a question yet. So we know that the adrenal gland covers metabolism, blood pressure, and your stress response. So if I have an adrenal gland that's not functioning, and most oftentimes, um, if it's an autoimmune disorder, what happens with your uh, adrenal gland is that your auto, as an autoimmune disease, it eats up a large portion of your adrenal gland before it's diagnosed usually that you have Addison's disease. So once that's that's once that's destroyed, it's not coming back. So what would be most important for you is to think, how could this put my patient in danger? And how would I recognize it when they did? So how can what I'm learning in class today put my patient in danger? And how would I recognize when it did? That's what I want you to start thinking about in this summary. I don't want you to write out tons of hormones or tons, I want you to think about those two questions. How would this harm this particular patient in this particular setting? And how would I recognize it? What would I do? That's another key point that I'm going to show you in worst case scenario slides. But before we hop to that, I want you to see like, what if you're reading? Have you guys ever seen a list like this? And I'm like, oh my Lanta. I, I, wow. I, how am I going to remember all of this? This is really tough. So if I'm reading con if I'm reading information like this in my textbook, how in the world would I make this make sense? Well, I have to do something. If I just copy over those actual words, no bueno, no help, right? That's not helping me at all. But I'd have to look at how can I chunk this information together to have it make sense to me? Well, it tells me I've got like three major categories, glucocorticoids, 
mineral corticoids, and an androgen deficiency. So there's three chunks right there, right? I know like, so in my notes, I might make just a chart that has glucocorticoids, mineral corticoids, and andro androgen deficiency, and that just has three columns. It doesn't matter how I would do it. What matters is that you do something with this information because whether you're a med student, whether you're a nursing student, or even when you're a faculty, this is really important that everybody knows what it looks like when a patient is suffering from whatever disorder or exemplar we're studying. So this is telling me, yeah, this is what you're going to look like when you come in. So I can't memorize all those lists, right? I, I can't memorize all those lists. But if I put it in three columns, I'm going to picture someone in my mind that says, okay, which one of these do you think would be the most common systems, symptoms or the most dangerous symptoms? Well, if I don't have glucocorticoids, that's like Oh, those are like when people are on um, glucocorticoids in the hospital, like we give them to suppress inflammation. That's what we do. Can you remember what happens to a patient who's on high doses of glucocorticoids for a long time? What happens to their blood sugar? What happens to their blood volume? I want you to look at thinking, how is what they're asking me to study right now? Is there anything I can draw from another class? Maybe health assessment maybe pharmacology, maybe my med search course, whatever it is, the more you start to try to make connections between other courses and what you're reading or studying, it's the bomb. It's going to help you so, so, so very much. That's um, if you're trying to just like study for a test because of stress, I get it, but that's not going to be the most helpful for you retaining. So thinking about, well, these glucocorticoids are just like what we make. Let's, let's borrow from our farm class. These glucocorticoids, are, our body normally makes them, but when we need some extra in the body, we give it as a medication. So let's see if you guys can remember what happens to the blood sugar of a patient who's on a lot of glucocorticoids. If it's going to change, which way is it likely to go? Is it going to increase or decrease? All right, I'm waiting for you guys. Is it going to increase or decrease if you're on a lot of glucocorticoids? Hey, maybe you haven't studied this yet. Not a problem. Or maybe you're just afraid to answer a question in a group and I get, to, oh, oh, look at this. All right, so we got them both. Okay, good. I love it. Do you know that people that are willing to predict an answer to a question do better on exams, do better with retention? So you just trying to answer a question means you're getting your brain ready for the information. Do I care if you're right or wrong? No, I do not. And you shouldn't either because it was just a prediction. But I promise you, asking yourself questions before you know the answer is a really good way to get your brain ready to receive that information. Think like, I don't know how many of you are gardeners, but think of like you're trying to plant a garden and the heart, the ground is rock hard. Well, you normally have to till that and get this soil ready to plant the seed so it will grow. You have to do the same thing to your brain if you want better results. So prediction, like you go rock stars at where you went ahead and put it out there. I love it. Yes. If you have excess glucocorticoids, your blood sugar does go up. Okay, and there's some other symptoms that go along with that, but we won't turn this into a glucocorticoid lecture. But the whole way to know the endocrine system is know that, know what the hormone does. And then if you have too much of it, then you're going to have excessive symptoms. If you have enough of it, don't have enough of it, there's going to be the decrease. So if I am somebody with Addison's disease, that means I don't have enough hormones because my adrenal gland can't secrete them, okay? So what would you expect if I'm in a crisis? What would you expect my blood sugar to be? If I'm having a crisis or if my adrenal gland is insufficient? So what might I show you? Am I gonna show you high blood sugar or low blood sugar when I don't have a lot of glucocorticoid because I don't have the glucocorticoid because my adrenal gland isn't working. Okay, you're going to have a decrease. Good. I love it that you guys are answering. You get it. So never look at a list and think, I can memorize that. And you guys start coming up with these crazy acronyms that you cannot like. Four women met a 
hypocrite. I mean, you start making up all these words to try and remember drunk. It only works. That only works for like minutes into the exam. It doesn't really last you for the rest of your life. Very few things will last you that long. But for something like this, I would go back and instead of just trying to memorize a list, I would say, why are they fatigued? Well, I'd go back and I'd look at my notes and say, ah, they don't have adrenaline. Ah, they don't have any glucocorticoid. That's why they're, why weight loss and anorexia? Well, because that's involved. I know from my notes before, do you remember from the notes before? We wrote down that it affects metabolism. So that would make sense why they have weight loss and anorexia. Joint pain, that's just kind of a, might have some extra inflammation there because they don't have enough glucocorticoids. You've got all these other issues. When you go through her and think, why is this a problem? That's going to stick in your brain much better. So what kind of cues would I put over here? Why does somebody with Addison's disease have fatigue? Why does somebody with Addison's disease have low blood sugar? Why do they have hypotension, low blood pressure? I wouldn't expect you to know those answers now. I just wanted to give you the awkward feeling of trying to predict, but that's what you're doing in your textbook. You don't want to rewrite your textbook. You want to write just some primary things here. I would just write, okay, I'm, I'm figuring out how to chunk it from my brain. I know that we're low on glucocorticoids, mineral corticoids, and androgens. So first, I better tell myself, go back and look what glucocorticoids do, what mineral corticoids do, and what androgens do. And then you can ask yourself a cue in your question. Hey, what do they do? Keep in mind, the more you interact with your notes, the better. So remember we talked back here at the beginning of these? I asked you to make sure that you leave space in your notes. You're going to go back and add extra depth to these notes. Don't rewrite them. Don't try and copy your textbook. Don't try and copy your PowerPoint. What you want to do is like, oh, I, I see by asking myself these questions that I don't understand this fully and I don't know. So that's when you can look it up, Google it. We'd love for you to use Lecturio resources to do it. Ask us on Discord. We'll help you. We really want to be there to help you. But you have to do something to engage the material. You seeking for it is going to be way more helpful. If you can't get answers there, you have class time. Because if you're doing the work where you write your notes in class with this intentional way, you've done your summary, same night and then you write your cues later, you're gonna have really good questions to answer a faculty. And I can tell you, nothing turns a faculty on. Like we get so excited when your questions mean you're learning. Not the ones where you ask us the same thing we just said because you weren't listening or you are you were on target shopping, which is very tempting to do in class. But those are the kind of questions that your faculty are gonna get super excited about answering for you. So. Our goal today is not to learn Addison's. Our goal today is learn, hey, if I'm reading a textbook and I see a lot of this stuff, I have to figure out a way to chunk the information, to group it, not memorize everything. It is better for you to have kind of an overview of what the types of symptoms would be rather than trying to memorize every list. Because most of your exams and NCLEX questions are going to ask you, they're going to give you symptoms from this list to see if you recognize that these could be a patient presenting with Addison's disease. Okay, now that was the first template, right? What I'm going to ask you to do now is to pause and reflect. That's another thing I'd like you to do when you're studying and when you're taking next. Pause and just reflect. What is one thing you're willing to try from this Cornell method, right? So just tell us anything. Um, I have more stuff to offer for you, but I'd love to hear your feedback before we go on to the next section. Like, what are you willing to try in your studies like today or tomorrow, within the, within the last couple of days of this week. So we're going to pause for just a minute and let you write some comments for us, whether you're on StreamYard or whether you're in Discord. Let's hear some feedback from you guys. Go, Jasmine. Hi, Jasmine. Um, Nurse Liz can give you help with that. Ooh, Jess, you're going to make up questions? Thank you. Ben, all right. Um, ben, I will post a template in the course for you, so you can print that off if you want to, or you can make your own. <gasps> all right, the cues. You're making me... Yes, cues. Okay, Shannon, I'm going to help you with the worst-case scenario. This is the way that I 
was the most effective for me in my advanced pathophysiology classes to do that. Cindy, write key points from your notes. Okay, like listen, we're not going to check up on you. We're here to support you, but I promise you this will make a huge impact on how you can understand things and start to make connections. Okay, that's good. Now let's go on and talk about the worst case scenario. Now we're going to stay on the same topic, and if this is a topic that's comfortable for you yet, don't worry about it. We can, um, if you want to go back and study more, go ahead and look at our farm video on glucocorticoids, and that will help you have some of that information in there too. But let's take a look at where you would make three columns. This can be on a separate sheet of paper. You can do it somewhere else. But here's a way when you're answering nursing school exams, whenever you see a diagnosis or a procedure. So you could write in the first column, diagnosis or procedure. I want you to be able to think through this diagnosis, this procedure. What is the worst possible scenario? Like what is the worst case scenario that's going to happen to this patient? Right? What's, what's just like, ugh. Like most people say, dead, which fair point. That's not the outcome we're looking for most times. However, how did they get to dead? That's what you want to put down. So worst case scenario in Addison's disease is an inadequate amount of adrenal hormones. That's going to be, that's going to be the biggest problem is we don't have enough hormones. How would you recognize it? Change in vital signs, right? We know their blood pressure would be low. We know their blood sugar would be low. And we're going to see all kinds of changes with the blood pressure is low, pulse rate's going to be high, and on and on. So here's how I use worst case scenario. Every When I see in the sum of the question, that's what I'm thinking through. Ah, they tell me they have Addison's disease. I know I'm going to need to be on the lookout for any of the signs and symptoms of a worst case scenario. And that would be one would be vital sign change, blood sugar change, those types of options. And eventually, as you're moving on out of patho, you're going to look at what you would do about it, okay? So in the stem of a question, when you're looking at a stem of a question, these are four things I want you to watch for. So if you've taken your notes in this format, we don't you think about the context of every nursing question matters, right? And honestly, taking the time to read the stem of the question, put it in your own words, and not to miss something, you, that's going to really help you. So the particulars are what's this patient's history? What setting are we in? Are we in the ER? Are we at home? Are we at a health screening? Are we in ICU? That matters. If you see a diagnosis or procedure, see number two there, you need to think what is the worst case scenario. On your exams, you're going to know which diagnoses you see. So you're going to want to work through each diagnosis in your notes. And this is going to take you time. I get it. But that's the investment when you're writing your own notes. If getting notes from a senior ahead of you or a junior ahead of you worked, we would all we would need is to buy a textbook, right? There's no difference. We just had a good enough textbook. We could all be nurses. But getting someone else's notes doesn't help you. You making the notes, the stuff you going through making the notes, that's the magic. Now, remember, whenever you see a number and it's associated with assessment, always ask yourself if it's high, low, or normal. That matters. And lastly, any assessment information you see in the STEM, is it normal or abnormal? I can tell you with certainty, if it's abnormal assessment, the correct answer is not going to be documented, right? It's going to be, they're going to recognize, do you know what to do in this case of abnormal assessment? So these four, if you were doing a really high advanced NCLEX review course with me, this is what I teach you. This is what I teach my students in regular classes, and this is what I want you to look for. When I see most things that are missed in a question, it's not because the student didn't know the content. It's because they missed it in a question, and this will slow you down enough that you can catch it and grasp it. So you ready to do a question? Okay, so we're going to do a question. So I want you to look at the stem of this word, and I showed you some ideas using those four steps. So a client has been diagnosed with Addison's disease 10 years ago. So I know they've had it a long time. And it's Addison's disease. Well, we've kind of been talking about that. So when you see a diagnosis, you're thinking, okay, what, what is that? But let's read through the question first before you get ahead of yourself. So a client's been diagnosed with Addison's disease 10 years ago and is being admitted to the medical surgical unit. What symptoms might the nurse expect for this client when experiencing extreme stress? Okay, again, we didn't get to do a full lecture on Addison's disease, so don't worry about it right now. But if I'm going to break down the stem of the question, 
What's particular about this patient? Well, they have Addison's disease and it's chronic because it's been going on for 10 years. Uh, they're being admitted to med surge. And what should I expect if they're experiencing extreme stress? So really I'm asking what are signs of extreme stress for a patient with Addison's disease? Worst case scenario, that would be an Addisonian crisis because they don't have enough hormones. And then is there any assessment numbers? No, there's no assessment numbers. You guys start doing this just on your questions and your exams. I promise you it will make a difference. So we don't have any assessment information on there. We're just going to go ahead and keep moving through. Now put the STEM in your own words. So how would you word this? So I, I got, what would I do for someone with Addis, chronic Addison's disease being admitted to the hospital and anyone being admitted to the hospital is stressed and they're having extreme stress? What would be the danger signs? Well, I know from that diagnosis, worst case scenario is an Addison's, Addisonian crisis. They don't have enough hormones. And I'm thinking back, what kind of things would I be looking for? Well, some of those other things, pain and neurology, we'll, we'll deal with those. But what's the thing that could really put my patient at risk? Ooh, low blood pressure, right? Low blood pressure could lead to shock. So I'm already thinking that before I look at the options. Now, this is where I want you to use your scratch paper too. If your school does not let you use scratch paper, um, know that on the NCLEX exam, you'll have a red on wipe off board and you can use it there. But I want you to write down one, two, three, four. So first, I've shown you how to rip apart a stem. What are the four things you should look for? Next, I'm going to show you how you eliminate answers and increase your chances of getting a correct answer. So here's our answer choices. I'm going to give you about not enough time. I'm going to give you 30 seconds to pick your answer. Ready? Go. Got about 10 seconds left. Okay, now that you guys have picked your answers, let me show you another strategy. And some of you are right on the money, right? So number one, what I want you to do is saying like, you're not gonna have an increased inflammatory response and a high blood glucose level because we know that cortisol, right, is gonna raise that and they don't have enough cortisol and these glucocorticoids. So we would expect their glucose level to be low and not to have a really high inflammatory response. So we're going to get rid of number one. So what I want you to do is to cross off number one on your sheet. And I want you to tell yourself why there's the key. My friends, if you will, if you will look at the answer choice and say yes or no, but say why you're not going to miss as many things as you do. So I want you to make sure like, we just said why we're getting rid of that because uh, they would have a low blood glucose level, right? So they wouldn't have there we go. They would have a low blood glucose level. That's what tells us it's a wrong answer choice. Now, let's keep going. We got one done and we said why. Number two, they wouldn't have an increased blood pressure, right? Because we would expect them to have low blood pressure because they have less aldosterone and less of the medullary hormones. So no, they don't have high blood pressure with Addison's disease. Okay, so that's why we got rid of number two, and we said why. What about number three? Extreme fatigue? Yeah, they'd have extreme fatigue. Why is that the wrong answer? Ah, they would have extreme fatigue, but they would not have increased blood glucose levels. They would have decreased blood glucose levels. So even though on some questions, you can have more than one right answer, uh, on this one, we didn't. We just had one. And you got it, you guys. Number four, low blood pressure. Say why to yourself. Low blood glucose levels. Say why. That's how you know that you have your best educated guess or answer on that question. So force yourself to say why, yes or no. Just how you feel is not good enough. And I would use this strategy when you're taking practice questions. And we have tons of practice questions for you to um, use on our site if you wanna do that. And then you can ask each other questions, but going through nursing school NCLEX kind of format questions is the best way for you to practice. And then after you do it, go back and break it down. 
Did you get it right? Did you get it wrong? What confused you? Did you miss something in the stem? You kind of do a post-mortem autopsy on how you performed on that. And you know, oh, is it most important that I get this exact question right again? No, because you'll never see it, this exact question again. But it's really important that you learn about your own brain, how you're answering questions. What did I not do? Did I miss something in the stem? How do I fix that? Did I not eliminate answers? Did I just pick the one I wanted? Yeah. Do you have to come to grips with in nursing school that sometimes all four answers are correct? Sadly, yes. But that's why this strategy will help you compare them to each other. So we did that with number four. It makes sense. That is our answer. So we have hit the end. Let me do a quick wrap up for you. Nurse Liz, also, we have a um, we have a 20% off coupon. And she's going to put that up for your QR code if you want to join. I'm ready to ask any questions, but let me see if I can do a quick recap for you. This is what I would do if I was writing. Oh, I like that on my face. This is what we would do. I would do if I was writing a summary, right? If you took notes, you're going, I would write a summary. Okay. What stood out for me most is I've got to be intentional about my note taking. So what am I willing to do with that? Be intentional about note taking. Write more summaries, not try and take dictation like I'm a court reporter. I'm going to... Look at how I can incorporate worst case scenario. How would I recognize it? What would I do about it? And we'll post that we'll post that template in our course. And we also have a lot of free study skill stuff out there that you're welcome to try. Also, we want you to be thinking about how do I use worst case scenario and how do I use the Cornell notes? Which one is my willing to try in my very next class? Okay. And then when you're answering questions, hang out in that stem. Make sure you know what it's asking you. I want you to make sure that you eliminate answers and say why. And then the third thing is, really, you can do this. I promise you can. The more systematic and methodical you are about it, you're teaching your brain to not be afraid on tests because you learn that you can do it. And I know that you can. So Nurse Liz, oh, and uh, Victoria, you couldn't have paid us a higher compliment to say that that went quick. So thank you. That means, oh, and the bunny's adorable. That means a lot to us. So please come join us on Discord. It's really me and really Nurse Liz who are there. Also, we have lots of other people who help us, but we try and hop on there as much as we can so we can answer questions for you. With that, Nurse Liz, is there anything you want to add? She says no, because she doesn't want to come on camera. <laughs> Harley gave you one chance to come on camera. So, hey guys, thanks for coming. Please um, trust that we would love for you to help us spread the word. We really do care about students. We want to be available to you. Make sure you tell a faculty, just, just throw a kind word toward a faculty. Sometimes we don't get a lot of encouragement. So we would love to do that at your program. Make sure you let them know that you appreciate what they're doing. And I just hope you can try some of these skills. And then we'd love to hear about what worked for you. All right. We'll see you in Discord and at our next live event. Bye, guys.